Come on, church, let's all stand and worship, please. We worship. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. Oh, yeah. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Sing it if you know it. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out his praise. Oh, we shout out his praise. That's right. We sing to the one who heals. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Listen. Cause he hung up on that cross Then he rose up from that grave And my God still rolling stones away Yeah! There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet No! We shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place and we won't be quiet now. We shout out your praise. For we were the beggars, but now we're royalty. And we were the prisoners, but now we're running free. And we are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on, join me and sing that. We were the beggars, but now we're royalty. And we were the prisoners, but now we're running free. And we are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on, all together now. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet, no. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, we shout out your praise. Oh, we shout out your praise. And all God's children said. All right, welcome everyone at Oakwood. Just a few quick announcements that are important to our congregation. Uh, Treehouse is still looking for some teachers, so contact Brianna at Brianna at Oakwood.org if you'd like to work with the children's ministry. Also, American Heritage Girls Troop, MI2407, is a Christ-centered scout type ministry for girls five between five and 18 meeting on the second and fourth mondays from 6 30 to 8 o'clock it doesn't say exactly when it's happening but it contact daniel phillips if you're interested and that's daniel phillips if you're interested more information at daniel phillips s-o-t-r at yahoo.com 
like you're going to remember that, but all right. <laughs> Danielle Phillips, get a hold of her if you're interested. Danielle, I'm sorry. Danielle. Danielle. Now they're going to enunciate. <laughs> now we got it. All right, we have a, uh, another communion service we will be doing on the weekend of November 6th and 7th, so let's be looking forward to doing communion, and that's on November 6th and 7th. Let's get back to worship. Have a great time. Love you guys. Well, every time I try to make it on my own and Every time I try to stand and start to fall Well, all those lonely roads that I have traveled on well, There was Jesus, amen mm. When the life I built came crashing to the ground when the friends I had were nowhere to be found But I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now There was Jesus Come on everybody, one voice In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing and the hurting Like a blessing buried broken pieces you gotta sing louder than that every minute every moment where i've been and where i'm going even when i didn't know it or couldn't see it there was jesus don't that make you smile in the hardest time of your life come on oh this man who needs amazing kind of grace Forgiveness at a price I could not pay Well, I'm not perfect, so I thank God every day Oh, yeah, that there was Jesus There was Jesus Oh, yeah In the waiting, in the searching In the healing and the hurting Like a blessing buried in the broken pieces Every minute, every moment Where I've been and where I'm going Even when I didn't know it Or couldn't see it There was Jesus On the mountain, in the valley There was Jesus In the shadow of the alleys Yes, there was Jesus In the fire and the blood In the healing and the hurting Like a blessing buried in the broken pieces Yeah, every minute, every moment Where I've been and where I'm going Even when I didn't know it or couldn't see it There was Jesus Oh, Jesus There was Jesus Come on, as a body, as a church today, lift it up. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing and the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Oh, yes. Every minute, every moment, where I've been and where I'm going, even when I didn't know it or couldn't see it. Sing it again in the waiting, in the waiting. I couldn't see it. There was Jesus. 
through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you, and it is well with me. God, thank you so much that as your people today we gather in freedom in one name, as one church, as one body. And I pray, God, that you would just wake us up today. Wake our souls today. Wake our spirits today. As our pastor comes to speak, come on, open the ears of these people. Open the hearts of these people. Open the lives of these people so that we see change. We don't just talk about it, we see it. And that's only through you, Lord. We just we wake up to your goodness, your mercies are new every day. And you know what? No matter what we're walking through, thank God it says that though the sorrows may last for the night, joy comes in the morning. Find hope and faith and, and, and power and joy and love and life in that verse that says no matter what you're walking through, joy cometh in the morning. And Father God, we love you so much. Thank you for our pastors. Thank you for our church and where you've given us a place to stay as we build and continue to grow. We love you, Lord. We pray these things in your matchless name and all God's children said today. Amen. That's right. You may be seated. You can give at oakwoodchurch.org or there's a black box in the back. But as we prepare for the next part of our sermon and our series today, just take a seat and let's get ready. As I was thinking about Pastor Appreciation Month, I was thinking about how lucky our congregation's been. But right when I said that, God smacked me in the head and said, it's nothing to do with luck. We've been blessed. In the last four or five months, we've had to meet at four different locations. During that time, we've had so many new people come into our church, and more importantly, those pe a lot of those people have asked Jesus Christ into their lives. So yeah, I think we've been pretty blessed. Not only are we blessed to meet here in the foreseeable future, but we have land that we've bought and paid for during a pandemic that soon will be the home of our future building. Yes, I think we've been pretty blessed. But none of this would be possible without the leadership, patience, so many other things about our amazing pastors, the three pastors that run this church. None of that would be possible. So as I was thinking, I thought of just a few examples that our church would like to thank our pastors for. They provide spiritual leadership to us. They prepare and do sermons each and every week. They oversee all of our ministries of the congregation. They celebrate with us in the best of times and they're therefore in our toughest. They teach us, they mentor us, they counsel us, and most importantly, they pray for us. <clears throat> they have a great sense of humor, and that definitely comes in handy with our group. They pick us up when we're down, they kick us in the rear when we deserve it. The motto of our church has been come as you are, but expect to change. There's nothing more important to our pastors than growing in the Lord and leading people to Christ. A pastor's job is something you just don't wanna do. It's something that you're called to do by God. All of our pastors were called for that duty. God comes first in each and every one of their lives. I could go up here and tell you about so many things that our pastors have done for me personally, but uh, I don't want to get up here and ramble about them for too long, so instead I've asked a couple of people in our church to present our pastors with gifts from all of us, you guys, as well as to share a few words about each of them. So can I get Pastor Kirk to come up here first, please?
Good evening, my name is Mike Edwards. Um, we're presenting Kirk with, with a gift for uh, just all the amazing work that he's done with this church and with the youth and just being a godly man and, and a friend to all of us. Um, personally, I've known Kirk for, I don't know, what, 16 years now? Probably about that. Uh, that's longer than my oldest son has been on this earth, which uh, now we have the pleasure of sending him with, with Pastor Kirk to uh, be in the youth group, which is pretty amazing. Um, played a lot of softball together, had some laughs, some, some uh, butting of heads, ever, a little bit, not, not too much, but it's all in, it's all in good fun. But uh, we, we really appreciate you. We love you to death. And we're so happy to have you here. Amen. Can I get Pastor Ron Woody to come on up, please? Well, what can I say about this man? Um, Pastor Ron was one of the first people I met when I came to Oakwood back in 2009. Um, it was a difficult time for him going through. Uh, the very first small group that I joined, um, I got to know him. And that was a difficult time as he was going through the loss of his uh, first wife. Um, and getting to know him and seeing his faith and seeing actually a pastor actually be human uh, and his frailties really inspired me a lot because um, the church I was brought up in 5,000 people in the church I spoke to the pastor maybe three or four times in the 15 years I was there so actually seeing a pastor walk through something as difficult as that and seeing his faith inspired me very much um, he was he serves uh, many different facets around here, uh, behind the scenes that we don't always see, the multimedia stuff that we do, the IT stuff, all the stuff in the back. Um, he's instrumental in doing all that. But his most important mission around here is to keep Pastor Frank in line. Um, Pastor Frank is the sledgehammer. Pastor Ron is the scalpel. Pastor Frank is the hot cup of coffee. Pastor Ron is the saucer that sits around that cools that coffee. <laughs> Pastor Frank is the bull in the china shop. Pastor, Fr Pastor Ron is the owner of that china shop that keeps the bull from <laughs> breaking the china. So, Pastor Frank is the trouble line. He's the baseline to keep everything in line. You want to raise? <laughs> so, it, it's amazing. As they say, opposites attract, and obviously these two have been a knowing each other for 30 years or so. And um, you know, as a wise counselor once said, if, if the two of you are the same, then one of you is obsolete. So, um, so he keeps Pastor Frank in line and Pastor Frank makes sure that Ron's still alive and pulls him along. So the, 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 the dichotomy between the two is amazing and, 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 and amazing to see behind the scenes. So, um, but the most important thing is that what they do have in common is the love for all of us and the love of this church and to see as many people saved and discipled as possible. And for that, I'm very thankful to have known him, Pastor Frank, and all our pastors. So, thank you. Yes, sir. Thanks, Dan. Last but not least, I think you might know this gentleman. Can I get our senior pastor, Pastor Frank Radcliffe, to come on up here, please? That's all right. You can share a little bit. All right, Pastor Frank. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Betty Whiteside. I have been attending Oakwood for 21 years, so I've seen us grow quite a bit. Um, I appreciate Pastor Frank, Pastor Ron, and Pastor Kirk so very much. One of the things that I really love about all three of them is that they don't claim to be perfect, that they make mistakes just like we do, and they're not afraid to let us know when they make those mistakes and ask forgiveness too. 
I appreciate all the hard work and dedication that all three of them give to the Oakwood and to our, our families. The one thing I want to say about Pastor Frank is 19 years ago, my dad was diagnosed with um, stage four lung cancer. Pastor Frank made it his goal to come over to our house. And when my dad did Jesus, my dad would never darken the door of a, of a church, no matter how much we asked him to. But Pastor Frank came over and had warmed up um, meatloaf and baked potatoes with my, my dad. And won my dad to the Lord that night. Thank you, Betty. Uh, so thank you very much to each one of these men here, but there's three more people that I have to introduce that I think, and uh, I guarantee each man here will say I'm right, that are probably more important to our church for what they do behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, and more importantly, what they do for each one of these gentlemen. Without them, it just doesn't work. Can I get uh, our pastor's wives, Robin Radcliffe, Kendra Woody, and Melissa Mars to please stand up and acknowledge them. Thank you very much for your guys' service. All right, let's go to the Lord together and we'll get back to our service. Father God, I just thank you so very much for everything that's gone on here at Oakwood in these tough, tough times. But today I want to thank you for our pastors, uh, putting them here. I ask you to continue to help them lead us into what you've got in store for us out there on Platte Road in our new building. I want you to uh, continue to help them help us grow in you. Continue to help them watch over their families. Put a hedge of protection around each one of them, Lord and just watch over them and guide them. We can't tell you how much they mean to us, Father, so thank you so very much for putting them in our lives. We love you, and in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I received a phone call the other day. Uh, it was early in the morning, and the phone call uh, went like this. It went, thank you. Do you know what today is? And my brain went, uh, Thursday? <laughs> and they said, uh, no. And they said it was uh, one year ago today that um, I called you on the telephone and you led me to Jesus. I walked into Betty's family's home and looked at an 80-something-year-old man that was dying. You could barely hear what he was saying, but it was apparent he needed Jesus. And I got the pleasure of winning him to Christ. So whenever God calls Mary home, she will walk into the arms of a man that's been waiting for her. That's what our church is about. We pray for people to get saved. We pray for people to grow. We pray for God to do things in people's lives. I, um, I'm standing in a room full of people that you are answers to prayers. I have a friend here named Sean tonight that I am so ecstatic to see him sitting in this building. It is unreal. And I'm sure his family is more excited than me. And it's all about people. The day you take church and turn it into anything else, you're out of line. And yet across our country, that's exactly what's going on. Because we're forgetting that our job is not to build social clubs and buddy foundations. Our job is to build places where believers get together and spend time with each other. Victor is uh, back in our midst tonight, so we're now official again. We have our brother from Kenya here, and it's uh, an honor to sit with him in church. So your Bible lesson for tonight. When I sit down and I said we wanted to deal with asking the questions that Christians all struggle with, um, this is one of the few questions that most of us don't ask for a friend. Uh, 
This is one of the few questions that most of us just don't get honest about. We don't sit and say, I'm struggling. We get around other Christians and we look at other Christians and we see them like, oh man, they just got their whole act together and they're, they're all God-believing and I'm just, I, I, I don't get it. Why, why do I have this problem with all these questions in my head? And so we get so afraid to be honest with each other. There's, there is, I, I'll use a complete different area. There's some of you sitting in this room that you've never been baptized. You became a Christian when you were a little older, and, and now you're scared to death to get baptized because you're worried about what people are going to think about you. An old Southern expression, who gives a fly and flip what anyone thinks about you? Because they're going to think what they want to think. Every single one of you in this room have your moments of time in life that we laugh at because you're a goober. And there's all other kind of times that you're really dignified and cool. And there's multiple other times that you're a jerk. And we're just humans. I, 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 somebody freaked out one time because I said the word damn in the pulpit. And I'm like, for crying out loud, you've, you've not heard hardly anything. I had another person look at me one time and say, I'm just not used to being around a human that's trying to be a human. And the issue with that is we are all believers, including our pastors. And there's not a super thing about any of us. We're just children of a holy God who loves us and died for us and adored us, and we became born-again believers. And then we have to top it off with, we have a nasty, foul, vulgar, animalistic enemy named Satan who the whole world pretends like he doesn't exist. And because they pretend like he doesn't exist, if you're a Christian and you bring up the fact that there is an enemy named Satan, you kind of get chuckled at. How many of you in this room have ever been in a situation in your life where you got laughed at multiple times and then all of a sudden one day it became very apparent that you were right and everyone else was wrong? How many times have you been caught in that situation? One day, there is a come up coming. And one day, every individual that looks at you and laughs and says, <laughs> You believe in God? And Jesus is God? And you believe in a devil with a long tail and little horny warnies and a pitchy fork? There'll be a day that you'll be standing someplace and you'll be looking at the one that they laughed at. And when an angel says, take a knee, you'll take a knee. And so will everyone else standing there, including the dog named Satan. And the friends that laugh to you will look over at that. And for the first time in their life, they'll know real fear. In the meantime, we're on planet Earth fighting a battle. And that battle causes struggles in our own life. So when I titled this thing tonight, Doubt, I went, God, how do I, I deal with this? Because there's so many people that struggle. So I thought I'd kind of start where I live. There was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. Him and his wife Elizabeth were righteous people, and they always wanted to have a child, but they couldn't. And so they went through the same things that everyone else did. They, they, as they kept getting older, they kept saying to God, God, I believe you can do anything, and they kept praying for this baby, and this baby never happened. And then they got old. And by the time they got old, they're not stupid. They didn't understand all the science things that we do today, but they kind of figured out the older you get, the harder it is to get pregnant. And you get to a certain age, you just don't get pregnant. And if you do, you're going to be the laughing stock of the whole community. And so Zechariah was on a rotation list amongst all the other priests, and it wound up his time to serve in the temple. So while he was serving in the temple, he picked up incense and he went to a certain table to burn this incense. And right as he did, he stopped and he stood there looking into the face of an angel. You can imagine how that would mess up most of your days. But he stood there looking into the face of an angel. And the Bible says that he was shaken and he was afraid. And the first thing out of the angel's mouth was, God has heard your prayer. Can you imagine? God has heard your prayer in his brain going, what prayer? <laughs> I mean, I've prayed thousands. You know, the, the one about you and the wife having a baby. 
Um, what? The one about you and a wife having a baby. She's old. Okay, she's now in that age where she won't even let me touch her. Okay, she's that old. And, and you're saying we're going to have a baby? Okay, okay, okay. Just, just for reference, uh, how will this happen? How many of you are aware of the Bible story of what happens next? Okay, you see in the Bible story what happens next is, is he just got his fanny in a whole bunch of trouble. And the angel looked at him and basically said, who are you to question me, the one that stood at God's throne and was told to deliver this message to you? So I tell you what, your wife's pregnant and you're going to walk out of here and two things are going to be a struggle for you. Number one, you saw an angel. And number two, your wife's pregnant and you're going to want to talk and you can't talk. Your voice is gone. And you won't speak again until this has been fulfilled. So can you imagine all of his life waiting to have a baby and all of his life, everyone in that situation living in that world had all of the stories about the day they saw an angel and this prophet and that prophet and these mighty things happened. He was at the cusp of something that happened to no one and he couldn't say it to anyone. Right around the same time, there was a little young woman that an angel showed up and looked at her and said, you're going to have a baby. And she looked at him and she said, how, how can this be? I, I'm a virgin. I, I've never known a man. What do you mean I'm going to have a, a, a baby? Why did he get in trouble for what he asked and she didn't get in trouble for what she asked. Why did God look down at Zechariah and go, and didn't look at Mary and go, how many of you have noticed? It's just, 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 it's a classic example. Hello, beautiful little lady. Would you please stand? Just, to, yes, ma'am, you. Well, I'm not talking to him when I say beautiful lady. Okay, do you guys notice any differences between her and I? A few? Female, male, beautiful, still needs help. A little shorter, a little taller. Young, ancient, and getting more ancient. Are those things obvious? Thank you. And here's what's really important. She hasn't been a Christian for a whole bunch of years. I have. I met Jesus when I was an 11-year-old kid. I'll be 64 in just a little bit. And so I have been walking this walk for 53 years. Do you know how many miracles I've watched God do? Do you know how many things I've seen God do that are just mind-bending? You ready for the biggie? Do you know how many times I've been told no? You see, I have a walk with God that is way different than a new Christian's walk with God. My walk is radically different. In fact, my walk is so different that the things that I do in my world can destroy thousands. Your world right now, not so much. But someday, you will be exactly where I am. And you don't have to be standing up here to be doing what I do where it affects people's lives. When Jesus' angel looked at Mary and said, you will have a child, Mary looked at the angel and said, but I've not had sex with anyone. That's called doubt. She didn't dare say it can't happen. She just stood there saying, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. I've not known anyone. He literally looked at the angel and what he said was, I want proof of this is going to take place. So would you please show me God's credentials and his bank account to prove that he has the wherewithal to bring this about because I'm married to ancient of days. You get the difference? 
When you're a brand new Christian, there's things that you're allowed to do that when you're an older Christian, those things need to be gone. There are things that I struggle with in my Christian life now that I didn't struggle with when I was a younger believer like you. But there's things that... You know when you're a brand new believer, it's like flowers and rose petals and some of your Christian stuff and you're just like... Ah! And, and then you start figuring out stuff and the, the war kind of breaks out. And what the enemy needs to deal with you with is basically to just kind of go... Where is me because of the years I've walked in the faith? No bragging. It's just life. You've been a Christian for a long time. Some of you, you know what I'm talking about. Hey, Satan can't go. Satan with me has to go, okay, where's the bazooka? Because I walk a different walk. Because I've been walking the walk longer. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? Okay, so when you start out your walk, you get hit with certain things, certain stuff that attacks you. When you've been in the walk longer, there are other things that attack you. I will push it so far to say there are more things that attack you, and the weight is greater. The weight is greater because if you go down, you go down with a whole bunch of people that have been watching you for a long time. If you're a new believer, that doesn't happen. But whether you're a new believer or an old believer, James 1, 6 says, but he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. And we read that verse, and it becomes one of those verses that we just look at and go, God, how do I even deal with that? On the one end, I'm, I, I haven't been saved very many years, and I, I, every once in a while the doubt just floods in. Am I really saved? Well, when I prayed that prayer, was I sincere enough? Did I have enough faith? Did I really believe what I was supposed to? And then I was sitting in a meeting the other day, God, and somebody started talking about the Bible, and they said something, and it kind of freaked me out. Can the Bible really be trusted? I mean, it was written so long ago. And it's full of mistakes, they tell me. How can I be a Christian if I keep sinning? I can't even get victory over this one thing. About the time I think I've got it proof and I'm doing really good, here it comes again. You see, when it comes to doubt and unbelief, many folks think that doubt is the opposite of faith. And the opposite of faith is not doubt, it's unbelief. Unbelief, so you can define it and so I can use it for the rest of my message, is a willful refusal to believe. It is a willful refusal to believe. Whereas doubt is being indecisive about an issue. So I want something to be understood. Everybody look at me real quick. You as a Christian are allowed to doubt and you are going to go to heaven and you are going to be with God and all these great things are going to happen. You are allowed to struggle with your faith. Did everyone hear what I just said? It is not a sin. Please, did you hear what I said? It is not a sin. The enemy will beat you up with that. Oh, look at that thought that just went through your head. And we're not smart enough to go... Well, you threw the thought through my head. We just get beat to death with doubt and guilt and frustration. And then we start sitting here and going, well, wait, do, I, do I really know Jesus? So number one in my notes, there is no faith without questions. None. In fact, I would put before you, if you have no questions, it's really not faith. Everybody please hear this. The Lord our God has secrets known to no one. Throw the brakes on. Got to make sure we get this. The Lord our God has secrets known to no one. Did everybody hear that? Yes. Everyone in the room that's control freak, say amen. amen. Stepping out on faith is kind of fun, right? Because you don't know everything, and since you don't know everything, you can't make any decisions. But because you're a human being living in the United States of America, you are so arrogantly conceited that you think you do know everything. And you can't handle the fact that God teaches us we don't know everything. We're just a stu I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, don't get mad at me. We're just a stupid, dumb human being, and we don't like that. 
But I'll prove it to you. In the last month of your life, how many times have you done something stupid that you can't understand why you did what you did? And if you sit in here and go, I haven't done anything, you just lied, so you got it covered, okay? <laughs> the Lord our God has secrets known to no one. We are not, don't miss, we are not accountable for them. I don't have to be accountable for things that I can't understand. I don't have to be accountable for things that God never revealed to me. But we and our children are accountable forever for all that he has revealed to us so that we may obey all the terms of these instructions. In other words, if God said it and God revealed it, then I have to live it. I don't get to make excuses. I don't get to lie my way out of it. And I don't get to pretend like it's not real. Zechariah and Elizabeth had this son named John. Most of you guys know we're talking about John, what people call the Baptist, but officially in the Greek, his name is John the Baptizer. He had incredible faith. For everyone of you ever read about John, agree? Incredible faith? He had to be to eat the diet he did, right? Can you imagine a diet of bugs? Oh, sorry. What happened to John? This is the dude that was out, don't miss, this is the dude that's out preaching. Repent. This is an individual that stood in front of everyone. And when Jesus walked down into the water, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. My world that I live in, I'm sorry because I'm a Jesus follower. What it does inside of me to think the thought of looking into the face of Jesus one day. Whew. He flat looked up at Christ, his cousin, and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The people in the group were brain fried. And some of them started following Christ immediately. It just totally freaked them out. This is John who wound up in jail. Got arrested. One of the problems with jail back then is, as you think of jail now, you don't think of jail what really went on back then. Because what went on in jail back then is you basically starved. Every day it was a struggle to survive. You were locked in a room, and there was no place to go to the bathroom, none of the things that we think about. And somewhere in the middle of sitting in that hell hole, John got the virus of doubt, and it started eating his heart. And he got so messed up with it that one day two of his followers came by and started talking to him. And he looked at them and said, is Jesus who we really claim he is to be? Will you go find out? And when the two guys tracked down Jesus, found him and walked up and asked him, are you the one that we have been waiting for? John wants to know. Jesus did not get ticked off at John and go, gracious sakes alive, what is wrong with this idiot? I mean, he stood out there and called me the Lamb of God, and now he's not sure who I am. He said, go back to John. Tell him what you've seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. That's where almost every one of us stop. Go see or go tell John about the miracles that you saw. We never deal with the, what he added. He said, and tell John, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. That was profound. Because what he meant by it was, John, You've seen it all. You're following. You're confused. You're struggling. That's okay. Just don't fall away. Keep following me and God will bless you.
It's the same thing Peter said in 1 Peter 5, 7 when he said, Give all your worries and cares to God. He cares about you. Everyone in the room that's a big boy and a big girl, will you agree with me that all of your worrying about the past and all of your anxieties about what's coming in the future don't change anything? How many of you have gotten that figured out? You can worry, sorry, respectfully, you can worry your little fanny off. Does it get you anything? Does it fix it? Anxiety, being anxious, all those rough feelings about what's going down, does that change anything? Number two, faith is not the absence of doubt. It's always going to be there. Peter, all the guys sitting there in the boat, everything doing what they're all doing, all the stuff. Peter's the only one that looks up and goes, can I get out of the boat and come to you? I want to ask a question, and I want you to honest to the Lord answer it. How many of you would have been boat getter hors d'oeuvres on the water? How many of you would have stayed in the boat? Now, see, there's a whole bunch of you in here that go, oh, I would have been out of the boat in half a second. Okay, I got no problem with that. If that's the way you feel, glory, hallelujah. And there's some of you, I know your personality. You not only would have been out of the boat, you'd have been punching Peter to be in first place out of the boat. But there's some of you that would have been back in the back of the boat hiding, going, there's a ghost out there. Okay, so wherever we do, let's do this. Here's Peter. He looks at Jesus, and he says to Jesus, can I come to you? And Jesus says, yes. And what does he do? Feet go over, he hits the water. Could you imagine? I'm, come on, come on. Logical, logical. Some of you are so spiritual, you think you can walk on the water in your bathtub, okay? But can you imagine your feet going over the side and they hit water that you're supposed to go into and all of a sudden you feel it on your feet and you're walking on solid whatever. Now, how many of you that would have just blown you away? Okay, so why in the blue blazes would some dude walking on solid water all of a sudden take his eyes off Christ and look at the waves going in and all of a sudden decide this ain't holding me and he's going to sink? Respectfully, it's one of the most stupid parts of Scripture. Jesus said, you can do it, get out of the boat. He gets out of the boat. His feet are on solid water. He's moving, and all of a sudden, he looks over. The, come on, he's a, he's, a, he's a fisherman. He's been doing this for years. He's in big waves. But, oh, the Bible says he gets on the waves, and he gets his eyes off Jesus, and down he goes. How can a guy so godly that he can get out of the boat, walk on the water, all of a sudden sink? Because he's a stinking human being, and it's illogical in the mind to be walking on water. Does that make sense? Yeah. So he sank. And Jesus says that profound thing. He reaches over and grabs him. And when it says, you have so little faith, why'd you doubt me? That's the thing you need to say to yourself every day. You have so little faith. Why'd you doubt me? If you want that in English, Peter, I created the universe. I can pull the molecules together to hold you in any situation. It's a really nice way of saying, Peter, you're not so fat, you're going to sink, okay? There was a daddy looking at Jesus. He had a child that was all messed up. And Jesus told him it's taken care of. He said something that every Christian needs to hear. I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. It's profound. We need to understand that doubt and unbelief are different. They're not the same. When good old Paul was doing what he was doing and killing Christians... The Bible says, even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ, my insolence, in insolence, I persecuted his people. I killed his followers. But God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. I was living in the world of knowledge, Gnosticism. If you've never, I know most of you have heard of the belief of, you know, the Gnostics in the Bible, but it means knowledge. 
And it's living in a world that what's in my head is more important than what God says. And just, just so we're all cool and we're all on the same page, respectfully, everyone in this room that's a human being, would you please say amen? amen. Hi, welcome to the world of being stupid. <laughs> They're going to film this tonight, and it's going to get put out, and I'm going to get an email or something from, how dare you call me stupid? <laughs> Whoever sends it, You're worse than stupid. You're a level past dumb that someone else isn't. See, I'm not kidding. You're a human, and you're really smart. Some of you people in this room are brilliant. But isn't it amazing how many times in your brilliance you have moments of just pure dumbness? And you walk away from it going, how did I do that? How did they go from one minute being just intellectually, oh, and the next minute, I'm a fart. How did that happen? And if we can't, as Christians, go, wait a minute, time, time out, time out, time out. I'm, I'm a part, don't miss, I am part of a people that have fallen. Eve bought it in the garden. Satan looked at her and said, did God really say that? And she did what every human being does. She didn't look at the enemy and go, yes, that's exactly what he said. We're not allowed to eat it. No, she had to do what all humans do. She had to make up her own stupidity. No, 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 no. He said no touchy. Did God say we weren't allowed to touch the fruit in the garden? He said we couldn't eat it. He didn't say we couldn't bounce it around, throw it at Adam, or do whatever we wanted to do. He just said you can't eat it. But we're humans. We make up our own dippiness. That's where religion comes from. We believe that I have to lay on a bed of nails for God to appreciate me. I have to stick my arm up in the air and let it rot off for God to appreciate me. I have to fast for 40 days or God won't appreciate me. i got to give bukus of money for God to appreciate me. God never said any of that. That's the game that we as humans play. And I love you. I am not. There's nothing inside of me tonight that's sitting here trying to be disrespectful, so I'm just going to be as honest as I can be and as loving as I can be. This sermon is not to you, it's to me. Because I have a problem with Gnosticism that few of you do. Because it's called self knowledge. It's me taking my experiences and my stuff. And thinking that somehow I'm at God's level. And I'm not. I love every one of you in this room. How many times did you think you were right that you found out you were wrong? How many of you were in your 50s and 60s and you look back at yourself in your 20s and you go... How many of you are bright enough and smart enough and, and, and strong enough to go, look back at my 20s? I look back at yesterday and make the same dumb looks. <laughs> Thank you. Good. We're cool. Doubt and unbelief are different. My unbelief is a normal part of my faith walk. Doubt, excuse me, doubt, get it right. Unbelief is me just standing up and looking at God and saying, I don't believe it. When you die, where are you going to spend eternity? Try it again. When you die, where are you going to spend eternity? Yeah, answer me or I'll give an invitation now. When you die, where are you going to spend eternity? 100% sure about that? You ever struggled with doubt? You ever gone, oh. It's okay to do that. How many of you enjoy eating? Everyone enjoys food, say Amen. Okay, do you know what you're eating when you get home tonight? I know what I'm having. I'm ecstatic about getting home and eating tonight. Now right, listen, just hear me out. If you don't eat, what happens to you? A few of you need to miss eating. <laughs> but if you don't eat, what happens to you? You eventually get weak. And if you go long enough, you eventually die. So all of us understand eating, breathing, drinking. We understand all that. I need these things to survive. 
In my spiritual world that I live in, I need the life of prayer. I need the life of Bible study. I need the life of giving. I need the life of being with you. I call people every once in a while and say, hey, man, haven't seen you at church for a while. Yeah, I know I've been doing this and I've been doing that, but, but don't worry, man, I'm watching it online. Just so you understand, the online service is not for you to stay at home. Because the online service is diddly squat. That's just so you can keep up. You need to be here with us. You guys hear what I'm saying online, right? You need to be here with us, fellowshipping and associating and being around people and helping people and caring for people and being involved in their lives. That's why the Bible says, forsake not the gathering together of the brethren and the sisters, if that's a word. <laughs> me getting to know the Word of God and going through God's Word, things hit me in the face. I... I struggled when I was an 11 and 12 year old kid. Did I really ask Jesus into my life? And so Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, I got saved. I got saved so many times it was ridiculous. I'm more saved than you are. I always joke with people about baptism. Most of you have been baptized once. I've been baptized 22 times. If baptism, baptism gets you to heaven, I'm going to heaven. I got baptized when I was a little boy. I wasn't a Christian. When I became a Christian, I actually got baptized, and they needed a baptism dummy, and there were 10 guys that were baptizing. I baptized twice by each, so 22 times of baptism. If they get you in heaven, I'm sitting right next to Jesus. But the kick is, it doesn't. And so all my griping and all my complaining and all of my having to go to Jesus and say, am I really saved? My Sunday school teacher looked at me one day and said, Frankie, do you believe in the Bible? And I went, yes. Can God lie? And I went, oh, no. He goes, good. I want you to look at 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. I have it memorized in the King James. In this version, I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may, what's that next word? No, you have eternal life, not hope, not be nervous and concerned. Frankie, I wrote this so that if you believe in the Son of God, you can know you have eternal life. I am 63, and for 50 years, I have never fought that battle again. I know where I'm going when I die. You go, well, what if I struggle? Okay. Faith. It's, it's, it's a simple thing, but I made an acrostic out of it for you. Find the real reason. It starts with an F. It worked really good. I was going to use Frank, but I couldn't work it into the notes. <laughs> Find the real reason. Why are you frightened? Why are your hearts filled with doubt? I want you to get real. This is, this is an assignment. This is, this is to help you. I want you to get real. I want you to find out why doubt is attacking you. And I want you to find out where it's coming in. Any of you in this room ever had a rabbit in your garden? Yeah. When you had a fence up? No. Have you ever, ever yelled at the rabbit, how did you get in here? And the rabbit was looking at you and going, yo, stupid. I was hiding behind the cabbage when you built the fence, okay? <laughs> I've been in here the whole time. But every once in a while, there's a hole in the fence, I never could figure out where the hole was in our great big fence area where all the dogs were. And so I came out the other day, this two weeks ago, walked down to the thing, Butkus, I let him go, and I looked up. Now, when I looked right in the middle of the yard, was this great big rabbit sitting there. And I went, oh, I'm going to learn where the hole is now. And Butkus is Butkus. And I went, Butkus. He went, sir. I said, rabbit, four o'clock. Butkus went, ah, phew. Would you like to guess how fast it took that rabbit to get out of the fence? I found out right where the hole was. The hole is now fixed. I leave the gate open so he can go back in because I ain't getting out next time. But anyway, sorry, another story. I'm challenging you. You struggle with doubt. I'm challenging you to ask the questions to find out why. Why am I going through this? What is inside of me that I'm warring with? And be honest with it. In, in fact, I'm challenging you to ask questions at a deeper level than just the normal stuff. See, normal questions are, are fine to ask, but normal questions don't answer the question. I'm challenging you to sit down and say, wait a minute, what is inside of me that is keeping me from making God stand at a distance where I don't let him near me? 
Is my question just because I'm struggling or is my question because I don't want to take a knee before the Holy of Holies? Am I struggling or is the real issue I don't want to believe? Because if I believe, then he's going to make me do things that I don't want to do, like go to church and go sit in a small group Bible study and tithe. Respectfully, I know people that are going to hell that will never become a born-again believer just because when they were young and they were growing up, some preacher said, if you're a Christian, you got to give 10% of your income, and they won't become a Christian because they ain't giving nobody 10% of their money. Can you imagine winding up in hell over 10% of your money? I was watching a video the other day. Are these important? Are these important? No. You're standing on a cliff and you go to drop it. And if you reach out and grab, you run the risk of going over. Let go? Or do you try to grab it? You know what it costs to replace them? Is it worth your life? I watched the video of a guy that was losing it and he was off balance. He's dead to get something that can be replaced. He's dead. Isn't it stupid that I will struggle with God and fight with God to not let him have control just so I can save a few bucks? Isn't that amazing? Fight with God and struggle with God just because I don't want to get up on Sunday morning and go to church. You don't have to worry about that. You can come on Saturday and you get to sleep in anyway, amen? But isn't it, isn't it crazy that we would do that? And so all I'm challenging you to do is sit down and, and ask the questions and deal with what's really there because it's impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. In other words, it's saying... Look, I, I, and I've done this with people, I love doing this, who've looked at me and said, I just, don't, I just don't know if I believe in God. And I said, great, great, let's do a little test. Just get down on your knees before you go to bed. You don't even have to get on your knees. Just sit down on your bed and say this. Hey, if you're real, show me you're real. And I've had people come back to me and go, that's really not nice what you told me to do. <laughs> do you know what he did in my life? I'm like, yeah, so do you believe he's real? Oh, yeah, I believe he's real 100% now. So I'm just challenging you. You sit down and you say, I'm struggling with all this stuff. A, ask for help. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God. Notice what James, his brother, says. You need wisdom? Ask our generous God. He'll give it to you. And he will not rebuke you for asking. That was the Jewish way of saying, you're allowed to say to a holy God because he's your father. You're allowed to say to your dad, I'm struggling. I need wisdom in this area. Would you give it to me? And he doesn't look at you and go, bad you. He looks at you and says, thank you. And yes, I will give you that wisdom. So when I say A, ask for help, I mean him and other people. I love James 5.16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Just so we're all on the same page in this room. Anybody in this room ever screw up? You mind standing and telling us where? Isn't it amazing how time we go to church and we play games with each other? Like, we're all so spiritual. How many of you cussed this week already? Raise your hand. Be honest. You cussed at least once, damn it. <laughs> you did it. You said it in church again. I said the word damn it, okay? I didn't say the F word. I, I said damn it and served one time, and like eight of you used the F word online, okay? <laughs> damn to the F word. That's a little bit of a leap, Okay. How many of you have noticed I've never used the F word besides Frank in the pulpit? Thank you. Okay, I appreciate that. Hey, I love the one lady that looked at me and said, wow, you wear that t-shirt that says Satan sucks. Okay. And so I'm going to make a t-shirt for her that says Satan forms a vacuum. 
And maybe that'll help her King James. I don't know. Ask for help. Talk to God. And look at other people that are following Jesus and talk to them. Look at them and say, help me. This is where I'm struggling. Once you've asked the questions, once you've talked to God, once you've talked to other individuals, I identify a path. You did your research, you asked the questions, now get a plan. Okay, everybody listen. When I say get a plan, I'm being sincere. Um, how many of you in this room work out regularly? How many regular workouters do we have in this room? Okay, how many of you never work out? Your workout is headed from the refrigerator back to the chair with... Uh, that's a workout, amen? Strenuous. Okay, and if you have to go to the bathroom in the middle of it, that's extra laps, okay? When I say identify a plan, all I'm asking you to do is sit down and say, okay, what does it take to help me defeat doubt? A young lady that was attending our church walked up to me and said, Pastor, I need to know how to get around this. I'm reading the Bible, and I keep running into these questions that I want to ask you. And inside I went, yes, I know. I'm just about tired of you. <laughs> She wasn't as bad as you, Margie. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. She literally almost drove me nuts. And she goes, yeah, but I just have to know. And I said, okay, we're going we're to do something else. This is the new something we're going to do. You're going to go get a thing with paper. We used to call those notebooks. I don't even remember what a notebook is. Okay, paper notebooks, not the computer thing. And I said, you're going to get a notebook, and every time you're reading the Bible and you come to a question and you don't know the answer, you're going to write that down, and you're going to put the date that you wanted to know that. And you're not allowed to ask me the question. She literally broke out in a sweat. And then I added what almost killed her. I said, for six months, you can't ask me anything. You're going to get a notebook and you're reading the Bible and every time you come to a question You're going to write the question down and you're not going to ask me And so she agreed Six months later she called me I said when you hit the six months call me she called me and she said are you ready? And I could hear her hands, you know, and I'm like, oh my soul. I'm dead <laughs> It was one of the most beautiful things I ever did in the ministry because I knew what was going to happen she sat down with it. It was full. I'm not joking. There was five pages of questions. But exactly what I knew would happen would happen. How many of you know that my name is not the Holy Spirit? I'm Frank. And I'm being Frank. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. Not me. So there's things that has hit you right in the head tonight. And there's some other things I've said tonight that have hit you right there. That's because of him. This stuff was planned a long time ago, but God knew you were going to be here. So don't miss. When she pulled her notebook out, there was question after question after question after question. But do you know how many questions had lines drawn through them? Do you know what the line was there for? She found the answer because as she was reading the Bible, the Holy Spirit answered the question for her. And she didn't need me. She met me one more time. She's never called me again. You know why? She found out he's the teacher. Does that make sense to you guys? So you sit down and say, I got I to gotta feel, I got to get this plan together. The Bible says faith comes by hearing. That is hearing the good news about Christ. I can't grow unless I hear. So finding out a way that I can hear, I have to set up a plan that read the Bible. Listen to certain things. Listen to things online. Go listen to the preacher. Be in a small group Bible study. When we became Christians, John 1, 12 says, He gave us the right to become the children of God. So because you're His kid, T, train your spirit. Train your spirit. Everyone, please listen to this thought because it's, it's important. Everyone in this room that's had COVID, and you don't mind. You just, you've had, yeah, I've had COVID, fine. If you've had COVID, say amen. amen. When you got COVID, did everyone tell you to make sure you keep eating? 
Because if you don't, you're going to get weak. I've heard person after person with COVID look at me and say, yeah, man, I didn't even have an appetite. Nothing, I, I, I couldn't even taste anything. I didn't want to eat. And I said, and somebody looked at you and said, eat, didn't they? Hey, guys. When you're going through struggles, keep reading the Bible. When you're going through your struggles, keep praying, keep learning, keep listening. That's why I say get in a small group Bible study. And if you're not in one, you should be. And if you want to experiment with them, this Wednesday evening, 6.30, come here, sit with us, listen to me teach about Revelation, and we'll break into a group and you'll get to talk to people. The Bible says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. Everybody look at me. Isn't this funny? I chose these messages eight months ago that I would preach this to you. I had no idea eight months ago that I would be standing here preaching this on the night that we would do pastor appreciation. But it says, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. What are the odds that that would be on the same night that we would do this? Mm. Christ gave to the church the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. In the original Greek, it says apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastor teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we come to such a unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full, complete standard of Christ. In other words, God gave me to you and pastors to you to help you grow. And not only did he give me to you, he gave each one of you for each other. That's why I tell every Christian I know, get in a small group Bible study. I'm busy. I love you. You ain't no busier than I am. And I'm in three Bible study groups. You go, well, you're paid to do that. Oh, so I'm paid to be good and you're good for nothing? <laughs> no. You see, I love you, and you're supposed to grow. And every once in a while when you doubt and you struggle, the same doubts and struggles that you're going through, someone else already went through, and they can sit there and tell you exactly what you need to do. But if you're not around them, you'll never hear them. Does that make sense? And the last thing I share with you tonight is it's rough, but hear it, okay? Handle the tension. Handle the tension. This is really important as a human being. How many of you ever notice that sometimes you ask God to do something and he gives you an answer instantaneously? How many of you ever notice that sometimes God doesn't give you an answer instantly? You say, God, why? And he goes, and he answers you. Sometimes you say, God, why? And you'll go for three months, six months, whatever. You're driving down the road, and all of a sudden, bam! It's just like, whoa, I got it. Thank you, God. Then how many of you have also noticed that there's times that you ask God for God, why? And he will not answer you has never given you an answer, and you ain't getting the answer until you stand in heaven. And if you're anything like me, you hate that with a passion because you're a human being. And I got to know. I'm suffering, Jesus. You should tell me why I'm suffering. See, we're humans, and we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we'll see everything with perfect clarity. All I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I'm going to know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. So someday the things that I sit and say to God, I don't get it. 
Why did you let this happen to me? Why, why did we have to be, I appreciate Joe saying it, why do we have to be in four different places for church in six weeks? Why couldn't we have just gone someplace and stayed there? What is the purpose of this, God? God's not lining up to look at Frank and go, Hi, son, let me let you in on why. And someday my Bible teaches me I'll stand in front of a holy God and I will look into his face and I won't care why. And then after quite a few years, we'll be standing in a garden talking and I'll go, why? And he'll go, watch. And when I look down into that screen, and I see why he did what he did. I'll put my arms around him and say, thank you for loving me. Even though it hurt really bad. So keep the tension. Keep the balance between following and I don't always understand. And realize sometimes he'll give you an answer. Sometimes he'll make you wait. And they're just some things you never get to know. Got it? Father, we thank you so very much for this evening. We thank you for this time that we got to be together and be in church. We thank you for being able to worship you. We thank you for every friend that is sitting in this room that's with us tonight, that you had a purpose for them being here, that it drives us crazy, but you got a reason. Thank you for touching us. Thank you for growing us. Thank you for working in our lives. I thank you as a pastor for every ounce of love that has been shown to me and the other pastors in this church because we serve here. Thank you for giving us the people that you've given us to serve. Thank you that just like they're grateful for us, we're extremely grateful for them. But Jesus... We're even more grateful for you. Thank you for working in our lives. We ask these things in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. You know, I just want to say one more thing. You know, this this month of thanking our pastors and uh, every single week, and we've been reminding you, and you guys have been really great. And uh, the gifts are just awesome, what we've been able to give the pastors. But I just, I, you know what? We're a team. You know, our church is a team. But I just want to just tell you guys, I want to point something out. Our pastors in this church are amazing. I wouldn't ask for any other pastors in the world. But I tell you what, I wouldn't ask for any other pastor to lead us than him. And it doesn't have anything to do with him being my dad. I'm just telling you right now, you know, I love Pastor Ron and what he does with this church. I love Pastor Kirk and what he does with our church and our youth and and how involved they are. And I love, they they are a great team. They are a strong team and, and, you know, they do what we're supposed to do as a church. But I just want to let you know that as our leader, I love following you and that, that we would not be here if it was not for you. So I just want you to know that. Amen. told you you're not good enough when he told you you're not right when he told you you're not strong enough to put up a good fight when he told you you're not worthy when he told you you're not loved when he told you you're not beautiful and you'll never be enough He will take your breath, stop you in your steps. And fear is a liar. He will rob your rest, steal your happiness, cast your fears in the fire. Cause fear, he is a liar. When 
and he told you you were troubled you'll forever be alone when he told you you should run away and you'll never find a home when he told you you were dirty and that you should be ashamed when he told you you could be the one that grace could never change oh fear is a liar he will take your breath stop you in your steps and fear he is a liar he will rob your rest steal your happiness but cast your fears in the fire cause fear he is a liar Let your fire fall and cast out all my fears Let your fire fall, your love is all I feel Let your fire fall and cast out all my fears Let your fire fall, your love is all I feel Oh, let your fire fall and cast out all my fears let your fire for your love is all I feel. Let your fire fall and cast out all my fears. Let your fire for your love is all I feel. Cause fear is a liar. He will take your breath, stop you in your Steps in fear, he is a liar. He will rob your rest and steal your happiness, but catch your fear in the fire. Cause fear, he is a liar. Fear is a liar He will take your breath Stop you in your steps And fear is a liar well, He will rob your rest Steal your happiness Cast your fear in the fire his fear he is a liar his fear he is a liar That's right. Come on, stand up. Tell somebody you love them. Go tell your pastors you love them. You are dismissed. Go be the church.